Well, I invite you this morning, if you would, to open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2. And our text this morning will be verses 11 through 16. Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 16. So if you'll follow along as I read. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles." Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. Well, Father, we thank you this morning for your glorious gospel. We thank you, Lord, for your church. And Lord, we have been entrusted with this treasure inside of these earthen vessels to protect, to proclaim, Lord, to guard the truth of the gospel. And I pray that we as believers would take that charge seriously, that you would help us to proclaim your truth to all who will hear. And Lord, now that you'll quiet our hearts and minds, that we might receive what you have for us through the Spirit of God. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one of the greatest threats to American soldiers during the Vietnam War was not attacks that would come from outside the ranks of American units, but from attacks that would come from within. And during that war, North Vietnam deployed units known as sappers. And these sappers would infiltrate U.S. forces and once among them would set off explosives and cause as much carnage as possible. In fact, these sappers were one of the most serious and feared threats to the soldiers in Vietnam. Retired Army officer Arnold Bloomberg writes about one such incident of sapper infiltration. On March 28, 1971, he says a unit of 50 sappers approached Fire Support Base Mary Ann, a U.S. Army base in Quang Tinh Province in South Vietnam. The base was defended by about 231 Americans of the 23rd Infantry Division and about 25 Vietnamese soldiers. The base, however, had become very lax about security measures because they had such infrequent contact with the enemy. John Patrick, an infantryman who survived the carnage, gave a post-battle interview, and he explained how this happened. He said these sappers approached at night when security was minimum and most of the soldiers were asleep. They silently cut through the barbed wire perimeter and in three-man teams, they began to infiltrate the base. And since they looked like their South Vietnamese counterparts, even though some of them were seen, they were thought to be part of the South Vietnamese army. Once enough sappers got inside, they began setting off satchels of explosives and then opened fire on sleeping or defenseless troops. They destroyed the tactical and operations buildings. They destroyed the command bunker. They killed Captain Richard Knight, the company commander. Men trying to escape the barracks were shot down on the spot. And after 10 minutes, 30 Americans were dead and 82 were wounded. The sappers then slipped away into the jungle, leaving the base in shambles. And the Americans called them sappers from the French word sepi, which literally means to undermine or to weaken. Now, I believe uh, this illustration, beloved, has a direct application to our defense of the gospel. Because as Christians, we realize that the truth of the gospel is at the very heart and soul of our faith. It is a non-negotiable truth that defines the critical aspects of our salvation. The virgin birth, the deity and humanity of Christ, his sinlessness, Jesus becoming a propitiation for our sins, his physical bodily resurrection, and salvation offered by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to name a few. And we need to defend the gospel at all costs. The gospel is the heartbeat of Christianity. 
And the truth that God has come in grace to forgive us our sins is really the truth that unlocks our understanding to all aspects of truth and life. The gospel for believers affects every area of your life. And we should thoroughly understand the gospel, be ready to defend it, and even be ready to die for it if necessary. However, what is not always so apparent is from where the attacks on the gospel come from. Now, we always have expected attacks on the gospel to come from outside of the church, right? That has been since the apostolic age. And as church uh, people, we understand that the world at large is going to attack the gospel. We expect that. There are many who seek to discredit the truth of Christ and his gospel. And we even know that there are those inside the church who attack the gospel at times. We know that heretics throughout the church history have infiltrated the church, have started to promote different heresies and different false teachings. But what I want to ask this morning is, what about well-meaning Christians who begin to add or take away from the gospel? And my question, beloved, for you today is this. Could it be that some who claim to be die-hard defenders of the gospel are actually compromising the gospel today? And the answer is absolutely yes. Now this morning we turn to the book of Galatians and here Paul calls us to an awareness and to a defense of the gospel. And it is Paul's cry to be aware that the gospel is going to be attacked, but maybe not in the way that we anticipate. In the Galatian church, the gospel was being attacked from the inside out. And Paul, remember, wasted no time in telling the church about this danger. Hold your place and look at Galatians chapter 1 and look at what Paul says in verses 6 through 9. After a very brief introduction, Paul gets right to the heart of this. And he says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed." Now again, we are well aware that throughout church history, the gospel has been under attack. The early church faced the heresies of Gnosticism, of Arianism. There was Doceticism, Montanism, Sabellianism, just to name a few. And even in recent times, we know the church has faced such internal things as modalism, the prosperity gospel, N.T. Wright's new perspective on Paul and many others. But there is another serious threat, beloved, to the gospel that we face today that also comes not from without, but it comes from within. And I am not convinced that the church is on high alert and ready to understand what this threat is all about. And just as I read about Army Base Marianne being lax and lightly defended, I think the church at times is very lax and lightly defended when it comes to discerning truth from error. And I want to suggest to you this morning that there are spiritual sappers who are infiltrating Orthodox Bible-believing churches, and they are preaching another gospel. Now this morning, I want us to look specifically at how Paul, in this passage, fearlessly defended the gospel. And in our text, we're going to look at two events that occurred because gospel truth was compromised by Peter, one of the most prominent apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in doing so, we're going to learn that even God's elect can be deceived. And we'll also look at some of the threats to the gospel today and identify why so much of what is being promoted today is dangerous doctrine. So let's begin. And the first thing we see in our text is Peter's deviation from the gospel. Look with me at verses 11 through 13. Paul writes, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. Now let's set the context here for what we're looking at. We know that at the time of Jesus' birth, there was a remnant of true believers. They were small, 
Mary, Joseph, Elizabeth, Anna, Simon, to name a few. There were others. And of course, these were people who trusted in the Lord. They did not put their faith in outward rituals or ceremonies that were prescribed under the Old Covenant. But the vast majority of Israelites continued to add to or to pervert the Old Testament revelation by putting trust in themselves. In other words, Judaism was at the point where they were looking to their own goodness and their own righteousness to make them acceptable before God. Now, most rabbinic traditions were grounded in works righteousness then through strict observances. We know to an endless array of man-made regulations and ceremonies. And thus, the religious leaders and the pious of the day believed that their religious works placed them in God's special favor and would gain them forgiveness for their sins. It was from this group that the legalistic Judaizers arose. And the Judaizers claimed to follow Christ, but they were teaching that Gentiles had to be circumcised and they had to follow the Mosaic law before they could be saved. And they also said that for all believers, both Jew and Gentile alike, they had to continue in the observance of the law in order to maintain their relationship with God. Now this teaching not only corrupted the gospel, but also the teaching of the Old Testament, because we know that the way of salvation was always and only by obedient faith in Christ. So in reality, the Judaizers were not teaching Old Testament doctrine, but they were teaching the cardinal sin of Satan, that a person through his own goodness and works can gain favor with God. And this is why Paul referred to the Judaizers as dogs, as evil workers, as the false circumcision, and he brings that out in Philippians chapter 3, verse 2. So in our text now, in Galatians 2, we find Paul is in Syrian Antioch, And of course, this is where the first church in a Gentile area was established. And this is the church where Paul and Barnabas served as co-pastors with the help of three other men. And this is recorded in Acts chapter 13, verse 1. And we're told there that Peter, or Cephas, as he's known, had been at the church for some time. Now, we know that Peter was one of the leading apostles among the twelve that both Peter and Paul had experienced salvation by grace through faith. Both of those men were directly chosen by the resurrected Christ to be apostles, and both had been used mightily by the Holy Spirit to establish and to teach the church. Yet here in Antioch, we see that these two stalwarts of the faith were about to come into a head-on collision. And this is what we saw in verses 11 and 12. Now let's understand what's happening here. We're told that prior to certain men, that is the Judaizers, coming from James. Now James here is the half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. The James who was over uh, the church in Jerusalem. We're told that Peter used to eat with the Gentiles before these Judaizers came. Now before I go on, let me just note that James, the head of the church at Jerusalem, would have no way endorsed or supported these Judaizers. So don't get the idea that James just sent them over to Antioch. And the reason we know that is because during the council in Jerusalem, James and others, including Peter, had spoke out against the Judaizers. So we know that they came basically on their own, but they're recorded as coming from James' church. Now here's another thing. The imperfect tense of the Greek verb here indicates that Peter's eating with the Gentiles was continuous. It was habitual. It was regular over some period of time. This was not a one and done thing. Okay, It's not like Peter came in and said, hey, I've got a little time at lunch today for you. We'll have a meal together, but I'll see you later. He was eating with them all the time, continually over a long period of time. But we're told when this party of the circumcision came, the Judaizers, that Peter withdrew from the Gentiles and he began to hold himself aloof. And again, I think the Greek gives us a clearer picture here. What we're told here is that this this withdrawal was gradual. It was sneaky. It was almost like Paul said, you know, I want to start separating from these Gentiles, but I just don't want to create too many waves. I just kind of want to get away from them in increments here. It was a slow effort to disengage with the Gentiles. But it gets more serious because Paul says that he began to hold himself aloof. 
And in the Greek, it means that he began to exclude the Gentiles to the point that he considered them disreputable. Now, why did Peter do this? I mean, this sounds so, like, unbelievable, doesn't it? Why did he do this? Well, he didn't do it because he feared the Judaizers. He didn't fear his life. He didn't fear his freedom. Remember that the Judaizers claimed to be Christians, so they had no authority from the Sanhedrin to arrest Peter, to imprison him, or to put him to death. The most that the Judaizers could have done to Peter was to criticize him, or ridicule Peter, or malign him in Jerusalem, just as they had maligned Paul in Galatia. And it was, beloved, this maligning that Peter was afraid of. This is what he was afraid of. He was afraid of losing popularity and prestige with a group of self-righteous hypocrites. Men whose doctrines were heretical and whose tactics were, were deceitful. And so we see the old Peter back, don't we? Weak and vacillating. For a moment, we see the old Peter. This was the Peter, remember, who once claimed he would die for Christ? Not them, but I'll die for you, Lord. And before the evening was out, he denied the Lord three times. So Peter, beloved, was being a hypocrite. And Paul would have none of it. So he fearlessly confronts Peter. And because the Judaizers had told the believers in the Galatian churches that Paul was not a true apostle, this incident becomes incredibly serious. You see, by withdrawing from the Gentiles, Peter, in effect, joined the Judaizers in belittling Paul's inspired teaching, especially the doctrine of salvation by God's grace alone. Now listen carefully here. Peter was not condemned in the sense of losing his salvation. Rather, he was guilty of sinful hypocrisy for taking a position that he knew was wrong. And I want you to think of the heartache and the sense of betrayal that must have stirred up in the heart of the Gentile believers. Can you imagine this? I mean, here is an apostle who walked with the Lord Jesus Christ, who was in Jesus' inner circle, who was having regular fellowship, and now all of a sudden, bam, everything changes. He's separating himself from them. And listen, the Gentiles that believed were well grounded in the grace of God. And how perplexed and how hurt this must have left them. I mean, how would you feel? You know, we got to drive this home, okay? How would you feel if Pastor Kreloff got up here next week and said, you know, folks, I'm Jewish, and most of you are Gentile, and yes, I love you, but you know what? I, uh, I think I need to really dismiss myself from your fellowship and really go fellowship with some Jewish brothers and sisters because after all, you're on the disreputable side. How would that make you feel? You know, I'm feeling Jim symbolism. I'm not feeling the love up here. Hello? Are we awake? You don't have to be mesmerized like, oh, you can say something. I want to feel the love. I love that line. That was a great line. Listen, if Peter had been left to himself, it would have caused a major schism in the church, and it would have done irreparable damage. And what makes this so bad is that Peter well knew, not only did he know that all foods were cleaned, but he also knew that all believers were equal. And how do we know that? Because of what he said back in Acts chapter 10, right? Verses 34 and 35, when Peter had the vision of the sheet, and Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. And if that isn't enough, remember what Peter stood up and said at the council of Jerusalem with great boldness. Hold your place. Go back to Acts chapter 15. Look at verses 5 through 12. Acts chapter 15, verses 5 through 12. Here we see an event at the council of Jerusalem. And it says, But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. And there had been much debate. Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. 
And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. And all the people kept silent, and they were listening to Barnabas and Paul. And they were relating with signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. Listen, early on, nobody heralded the gospel more courageously than Peter, right? You want to see two of the greatest sermons ever written by a man? Go to Acts chapter 2 and chapter 3. And now we get this. Peter knew the gospel, but listen, he willfully abandoned the truth for the sake of his own agenda, looking good and maintaining status with the hypocritical Judaizers. And don't we often do the same thing? Yes, amen? We're tempted to, yeah, I know, but... We're told that every Jewish believer defected into this sin. And even godly Barnabas, one of the pastors, co-pastors at Antioch, was carried away by this sin. And no doubt, this could have been the reason why Paul and Barnabas had such, such trouble later on. And again, beloved, listen, this must have had a devastating effect on the Gentile believers. But even that, along with knowing they were going against the truth of their convictions and their consciences, it wasn't enough to turn them from the error of their ways. Now, I think there are things, beloved, that we need to learn from this, and I think there is application that needs to be made here. First of all, we have to realize that even gifted and very popular ministers of the gospel can commit serious transgressions and become guilty of the very errors that they once strongly preached against. Amen? That's better. It's like a warm blanket when I hear that. Just... Second, we learn that faithfulness involves more than being or believing right doctrine, that Right doctrine without right behavior always produces hypocrisy. Third, we learn that truth is more important than outward harmony and a compromising peace. Christian fellowship is built on the unity of truth. It's never built on falsehood. And I've said many times that we can never have true unity without doctrinal integrity. Fourth, we learn that situation ethics is ungodly ethics. Human situations or circumstances don't determine what is right or wrong. Only the objective standards of Scripture do that. And fifth, we learn that falsehood is not to be ignored regardless of the consequences that it might bring. And listen, when falsehood strikes at the heart of the gospel, it calls for a fearless defense of gospel truth. Now, if you want to be, really know my heart this morning, beloved, this is a message I wish I did not have to preach. But there is a dangerous movement gaining momentum in the church today, and it is the social justice movement, and it is a dangerous threat to the gospel. There are prominent pastors and men in the church who are injecting worldly ideologies of social reform into the church and here's the key, and insinuating that they must be embraced as a necessary part of the gospel. Now, I'm not here this morning to lecture you all on the nuances of the social justice movement. Robert Frere can do that. No, we, we, we have a Sunday school elective that, that explains all that. By the way, he did an, an excellent job in the class. I am, however, wanting you to understand the fundamental teaching of this movement so that we can expose why this movement is such a threat to the gospel. Now, let me define social justice as it's being promoted today. Social justice states that certain groups of people due to race, gender, or sexual preference, or economic choices, or personal ideology have been and still are abused by our society. This demands a realignment in society because society then is unjust. 
The goal is to adjust society so that people of all races, genders, sexual preferences, economic status, and ideologies are all treated equally. The cause of this injustice is that those who are minorities are weak because they are being oppressed by those who are in power. Now, there are two equally dangerous ideologies that flow out of the social justice movement, and I want to define them briefly so that you can understand how they, too, pervert the gospel. The first is known as critical race theory, CRT. UCLA's School of Public Affairs describes CRT this way, that racism is ingrained in the fabric and system of American society. And this assumption means that individual racism, listen here, need not exist in order for institutional racism to be pervasive in the dominant culture. Because all relationships are best understood in terms of power dynamics, CRT asserts that existing power structures are based on white privilege and white supremacy, which perpetuates the marginalization of people of color. CRT then assumes that people of color are inherently oppressed and that they are marginalized by power structures and institutions which are rooted in white privilege. And therefore, their idea is that those institutions must be deconstructed and rebuilt in order to have equal justice. And if you're wondering, beloved, where the defund the police come from, this is where it comes from right here. This is exactly where it comes from, because you see, the police are seen as an arm of white culture, and as such, are seen as oppressors who must be removed. In addition, CRT asserts that there is systemic racism in the white race, and that every white person is a racist, and they must confess and acknowledge that they are oppressors. There is, however, and this is the thing, there is no redemption, there is no forgiveness, there is only perpetual condemnation. Now, in addition to the ideology of what is to this is a term that we hear called intersectionality. And let me explain that to you. Intersectionality describes the way different types of discrimination overlap and thus define an oppressed person's experience. It's the idea that one's true identity is measured by how many victim statuses you can call your own. And again, it is seen through the lens of power dynamics so as to describe a person's social position in terms of discrimination and disadvantage. So the more disadvantaged group you identify with, the more oppressed you are. For example, a black man is seen to be more oppressed than a white man. A black woman is more oppressed than a black man. A black lesbian is more oppressed than a black heterosexual woman, and on and on it goes. And the more victim statuses a person has, the greater his or her insight and authority to speak on these issues is. So if you're not in a victim group, what they will tell you is you just shut up and sit down because you can't know anything about this. You have no voice or ability to understand anyone that is oppressed. Now this epistemology provides almost a Gnostic understanding of what they're wanting to incorporate in the gospel that some can understand, others have no clue. Now, there is much, much more to these movements than what I have described, but my goal this morning is not to talk about politics or economics or sociology. I've given you a basic understanding of these ideologies to show you why they are a threat to the gospel. So let's go there. First, let me establish, of course, that society is unjust. Amen? Society has always been unjust. Our country's unjust. Every country in the world has an unjust society. And the reason for that is because people are flawed, the government is flawed, institutions are flawed, because they're run by sinful, fallen, corrupt human beings. Amen? Amen. Oh, wow. <laughs> nice, nice. But listen, as Christians, we should care about social justice. Listen, don't get the idea that I'm saying that social justice is wrong. We know it exists. We shouldn't be okay with it. Social justice is, is, is something that every Christian wants at the core level. But what we have to understand is, how is this being injected into the gospel? Are you with me? We should realize that all men are created in the image of God and therefore are of infinite worth. And we should call out injustice and we should call out discrimination especially where it legitimately exists. 
The problem is this, beloved, that social justice demands that we see people as victims and that each group of victims has a right to condemn those that they see as abusers and oppressors of a particular social niche. That puts people in different categories of justification and entitlement. Now here's the thing, in reality, we are all victims. We're all victims of Adam, amen? amen? We are all victims of Adam. Fundamentally, the world is full of victims, victims of war and genocide and crime and terror. But here's the problem. Lately, this victim status has been embraced by the evangelical church and the need for social justice is promoted as an essential part of the gospel. The problem with this is that social justice is an economic concept. It's not a spiritual concept. I think John MacArthur gets right to the heart of it by asking a very penetrating question. He says this, Is social justice part of the saving gospel, or is caring for people a result of the gospel? And I would claim the latter, amen? Right? Listen, we should care about people. We're changed. We're given a new nature, a new heart. When I pastored in Orlando for 13 years, that was the most diversified church you'd ever find, and that was the sweetest fellowship you could ever enjoy. And it was the gospel that did that. Thank you. Social justice is not a part of the gospel, but when we make it so, it becomes a serious hindrance to the gospel. Why is that? First of all, it legitimizes the right of people to claim a victim status, okay? And isn't this the default of all human beings, right? To blame someone else for their condition or their troubles? Listen, this goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, doesn't it? When God confronted Adam about eating from the tree, Adam said, hey, that was the woman you gave me, that's her. That's my problem. And when he confronted Eve, Eve said, oh, oh, that's that serpent. That, that's not me. Hey, who knew? Now think about this. There were only two people on the face of the earth and we had social injustice. <laughs> two people! That's it! They couldn't even get it right. And this is the classic blame shift, isn't it? But listen, don't be deceived because in the end, to declare yourself a victim, beloved, is to inevitably blame God. God, you did this to me. You put me in this group. Here's the problem. When we legitimize a victim status for people, we aid and abet their disavowal of their own sinfulness. This assaults the gospel because seeing one's own sinfulness is the very entry point of the gospel. The problem with letting people define themselves as victims is they disavow responsibility for their own sins. People don't come to true salvation until they realize that salvation is about being delivered from your sins. You don't come to the gospel until you come to a full realization that you are the reason you have problems and that who you are by race, gender, or status is because of the fact that God providentially put you there. Now listen, the gospel isn't designed, beloved, to accommodate equity through human social engineering. Our equity comes through regenerated hearts. That's where our equity comes from. And tearing down power structures and institutions, as CRT demands, is not going to bring man any closer to social justice this side of heaven. Because man's fundamental problem is that he sinned against a holy God. And this is true for people in every category of life. And intersectionality is a worldview which denies God's sovereignty and His creation and His prerogative order for people in the world. It also rejects outright the oneness Christians have with one another because of our union in Christ. It promotes the worst kind of racism in that it demands that some have a voice and others don't have a voice. The social justice movement rebuilds the walls of segregation and prejudice that the gospel tears down. 
Yet many prominent Christian leaders are embracing these ideologies, and they are promoting this as a necessary part of the gospel. Who are these men? Uh Uh-oh. Oh, here he goes. Before you pick up your tomatoes and get ready to throw them at me, let me say this. There are men who come from Reformed churches, men we trust, men we read, men we attend conferences with, men with familiar names and faces, men that I love and I have learned much from. And again, before you get too offended, let me give some qualifiers here. The people that I'm about to name, I'm not labeling them as heretics, nor am I suggesting that they are out to destroy the church. I believe most of them are true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and as such, I count them as brothers in Christ. But lest you think that men could never go astray, I remind you of Peter and Barnabas and many of the Jewish converts in Galatia. Listen. Do you think that just because you like a man today or you've read some of his books that he's beyond error? I hope you don't think that. It happened to Peter. Think about that. And Paul fearlessly confronted Peter publicly and called him out. And in like manner, when it comes to the gospel, we need to call out error as well. Again, my goal here is not to excoriate an individual, but just to relate to you what is being said for you to be discerning and to understand why this is so dangerous. At the 2019 Southern Baptist Convention, National Convention, they passed what is known as Resolution 9. Has anybody ever heard of Resolution 9? Okay. I wish every hand in here would go up. Resolution 9 states this, that critical race theory and intersectionality are useful analytical tools to be properly employed by faithful Christians. Now let me tell you what I know, beloved. Ideas have consequences, right? And when you allow secular social thinking to get into and work its way into gospel truth, you are going to have problems. And so many of these things on the surface sound pretty plausible. We all want social justice. We all want people to be treated fairly. We all want to be active as Christians in promoting that, and we should. But there is an ideology behind this that is is not godly. It is secular. Tom Askell, president of the Founders Ministry and pastor of Grace Baptist Church in Cape Coral, Florida, said this, The silence of godly men was deafening. There was no real opposition, so it passed. And listen, I want to ask you again. Can you imagine if Paul got to the church at Antioch and he saw Peter sitting over here with all of the the Jewish uh, Judaizers and he said to the Gentile believers, well, you know, Peter's probably having a bad day. Let's just let it go. Let's not say anything. I'm sure he'll come around in time. What do you think would have happened? That would have been devastating to the church. Listen, he wouldn't tolerate that. We have to think about what is being said. Ligon Duncan, Chancellor and CEO of Reformed Theological Seminary, endorsed the book, The Woke Church, by Eric Mason. Mason is the pastor of Epiphany Fellowship Church in Philadelphia, and he stated in his book the need for intervening justice. And he defines it this way. The effort to tend and meet pressing needs, listen, without which persons will not be receptive to the gospel message. So Mason makes the pursuit of social justice an essential condition for people to come to Christ. Dr. Anthony Bradley, professor of religious studies at King's College, is one who is totally committed to critical race theory, and he said this, I cannot even allow the thought that evangelicals have ever possessed the gospel. And he's saying that from a black church perspective, white evangelicals have never understood the gospel. Tim Keller and Russell Moore have slandered the signers of the statement on social justice, which I signed and I support with my life, by accusing them of not caring about the justice of people or the poor. Jarvis Williams, professor of New Testament studies at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, recommends a book on critical race theory saying this, I wish every evangelical Christian would read this. 
And he went on to say that this was one of the books that most influenced his understanding of social justice. Listen, beloved, this has nothing to do with the gospel. And I could go on and on. Listen, as Christians, we should care about the plight of men because of the way the gospel changes us. But the gospel isn't designed for you to gain a social status. It isn't designed to give you privilege. It isn't designed to make you feel better about yourself. It isn't designed to make your life more successful or profitable. It isn't designed to give you your best life now or fix your marriage or get you a new car or secure reparation for all the injustices of the world. The gospel is designed to rescue you from hell and bring you into glory. That's what the gospel is all about. And just as Peter deviated from the gospel in his day, so we see men in our day who are doing the same thing. And again, I'm not out to excoriate these men. I love these men. I've I've learned from these men. I've, I've met these men. But listen, when it comes to the gospel, I may be a nobody, but I'm not going to stand back and let this go without warning the church. Let God be found true and all men be found a liar. Amen? Listen, this isn't about me. So having seen Peter's deviation from the gospel, we now see Paul's defense. Look at verses 14 through 16. Turn back, if you will, to Galatians. We read in 14, But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, If you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. Now, here's the thing. The actions of Peter and Barnabas and other Jewish believers in in Antioch, listen, this was not just a case of personal hypocrisy. Their concession to the Judaizers was actually fracturing the church. The fact that Peter and Barnabas were spiritual leaders of the church made this immeasurably worse. They had taught salvation by faith alone. They had exemplified that teaching in their lives. The church at Antioch had become a model of Jewish Gentile fellowship. And now, almost overnight, just the opposite was occurring. And Paul saw saw they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. In the Greek, that word means to be straight-footed, or to walk straight, or to walk uprightly. So Paul saw Peter and the others were not straight-footed towards the truth of the gospel. And here's another important thing to note. That Paul's rebuke of Peter and the others was done in public because Peter's offense was done in public. And if there is public sin, there needs to be public rebuke or the church will think that the leaders don't take sin seriously. And this shows that no public leader, regardless of status, is beyond the discipline of the church. And of course, Paul goes on to point out Peter's inconsistency, as we read in verse 14. And here's how we could paraphrase what Paul is telling Peter. He's saying, look, Peter, if you, a Jew, allowed yourself the freedom of ignoring Jewish tradition with respect to eating and drinking, as you did when you freely ate with the Gentiles, then how can you now impose these very traditions upon the Gentiles and force them to live like Jews? By separating yourself, Peter, you are saying to the Gentiles, look, if you wish to have fellowship with me, you'll have to adopt our customs and you're going to have to live like the Jews. I think John MacArthur explains this well. He says, Paul had no desire to lord it over Peter or build up his own reputation at the expense of a fellow apostle. His motive was not to humiliate Peter, but to correct him in a serious error that caused many other believers to stumble with him. He could tolerate nothing that threatened the integrity of the gospel, especially if that threat came from a prominent leader, an influential leader such as Peter. 
And he goes on to elaborate further in 15 and 16. And Paul is showing that though Peter himself and the others were by birth, that is race or descent, Jews, who were the privileged people, they were given the covenants, they were given the law, they had a theocracy under God, they were not of the core sinners of Gentile descent, that's what Paul's saying. But then Paul says, when they learn that all of the works they did in obedience to the law could never make them righteous before God, and that this standing could only be attained through faith in Christ, then even they who were so self-esteeming and looked down upon the Gentiles began to see that they were no better than the Gentiles. You know, one of the great things about the gospel is it brings true humility. Amen? You realize for the first time, listen, we are what we are by the grace of God. We're not better than any man. And we should live that way. And we should love that way. Beloved, like Paul, each of us has to discern and be alert to threats that come to the gospel. I don't see this movement going away anytime soon, but we have to be able to defend gospel truth. Again, this isn't a call against social justice. This is a call against social justice being injected into the gospel as necessary. All claims that salvation is belief in Christ plus something else is blasphemous. There can be no effective or acceptable human addition to the work of Christ and to create any social distinction between races is to undermine the gospel. We must never revere any man to such a point that we are too timid or reluctant to call out threats to the gospel, even if it's a brother in Christ. And we do it, we pray, with the greatest respect. I pray that our love for Christ and his gospel and that our love for one another would compel us to gather to seek the love and the harmony and the unity that comes only from the power of the gospel. And that is the only power that can, tur- can turn condemned sinners into unified saints. Let's pray. Well, Father, how we thank you that You loved us, Father, when we were as yet unlovable. And Lord, we thank you that you have given us the ability to love you and others with all of our heart and our mind and our soul and our strength. And we thank you, Lord, that we are redeemed, that our sins are forgiven, and that we now walk in newness of life as new creatures in Christ. And so, Lord, with that great privilege, help us, we pray, to live out the light of the gospel to live in the joy of the Lord and to care about the souls of men, to show the love of Christ to others, to walk, Lord, in humility, realizing that we are only what we are by the grace of God. And Father, we pray that you would help us to stand faithful and courageous in defending the truth of the gospel, not, Lord, for the sake of contentiousness, but out of concern for the souls of men. And we ask it for the fame of your name. And through Jesus, amen.